from where do we derive our values validly? Mm -hmm. And if you say there are no valid values, well, then that's nihilistic. It's confusing because what do you do then? <laughs> Nothing's more important than everything is equally unimportant. Well, that's, that's indis if you really believe that and you act it out, that's virtually indistinguishable from being clinically depressed and, and paralyzed, let's say, by anxiety. The way I understand it, uh, Jordan, your, your key goal seems to be to encourage people to cultivate the strength necessary to repeatedly face the unknown in the pursuit of a worthy goal, as this is where meaning lies. Not only is finding meaning very satisfying, but such meaning makes life worthwhile, even in the face of suffering. Does that sound reasonably accurate? Yeah, it's an elevator pitch. It's not too bad. Okay. <laughs> Good to hear it. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's strength in some sense, I suppose, is probably not the most precise characterization. Okay. Um, because it's not, it's not, it's too narrow. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm in, interested in the practical utility of ethical virtue. That might be a way of thinking about it. You know, I mean, there's a way you're hypothetically supposed to behave and a way you're not supposed to behave. And it's easy for that to degenerate into a kind of rule bound finger wagging. Mm -hmm. And that's not helpful, mm -hmm. I don't think, because genuine ethical virtue is a source of, it's the only source of resilience and strength that you have and it's also the place as far as i can tell that the meaning that allows you to set yourself against suffering resides you know people talk about life and its meaning and they say well life is meaningless but people never mean that because if you're in pain or you're terrified you're overwhelmed with meaning it's just not the kind of meaning you want and so and it's not a reality you can talk yourself out of easily. And that's particularly true of pain, but it can also be true of anxiety. And so the question is, is there a reliable source of meaning that you can set against that? And, and what's its nature, if so? And so here's a way of conceptualizing it to some degree. So I'm currently in a rather remote location in northern Ontario. And uh, one of the advantages to being here is that I can go out on my dock at night and I can look up and see the night sky. And when you see the night sky, when it's pitch black, you, you are face to face with something as near to the infinite as we can face in a prosaic day-to-day -day setting. And so there's an experience that goes along with that. And the experience is one of awe and wonder. And awe is a very interesting emotion let's say it's unbelievably ancient from a biological perspective so if you feel awe your hair might stand up on end mm -hmm. and sometimes you get that feeling chills running down your back say when you're listening to music that you particularly enjoy and that's a variant of the reflex that that prey animals have when they see a predator and their hair stands on end so that they look bigger. Now, of course, they don't know that. So part of that feeling of awe is tied to our ancient mammalian heritage. It's, it's, a, it's a variation of the response we had to a predator. We're in the face of some, we're facing something much greater than ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so, but there's more to it if you think it through, because when you face the night sky, for example, or you face something, you confront something that fills you with wonder and awe, there's also a call to action that's sort of implicit in it. And maybe you think, well, the wolf is calling to the rabbit to be uh, better at defending itself mm -hmm. in some sense, to be a better rabbit, because otherwise, man, you're going to be eaten by the wolf. And when you look up to, in the night sky to the night sky and you feel awe, there's a call there. It's part of that experience to imitate that great thing that you perceive. Now you might say, well, how can you imitate the infinite cosmos as well? <laughs> Obviously that's a very complicated question, but you know, you're a very complicated thing and God only knows what it means for you to imitate the infinite when you apprehend it. I mean, that's in some sense, that's the fundamental question of life is how do we 
adapt ourselves to the infinite complexity that surrounds us, what must we become? Well, you don't think, you don't merely think that through. And I, I mean, you don't, I don't, human beings in general don't. We puzzle it out and we use all sorts of information to do that. And, and some of these more primordial experiences that are outside the domain of strict rationality, nonetheless point us in an, in an ethical direction. And, and the ethic would be you should be, you could, should and could be more than you are. Well, then the question mm -hmm. is, well, how do you bring that to earth? How, how does that look when you try to embody it day to day? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say these, and this, these are obviously not my ideas. They're very old ideas. Well, maybe you ally yourself with truth to the degree that you can. Maybe you pursue beauty. Maybe you pursue the love that attaches you appropriately to other people, et cetera, et cetera. And so, and you do that because, well, I think you do it because life is very, very difficult. And I was talking to my wife the other day, and she's become very interested in Christianity. And she was talking about uh, a set of mysteries that are part of the Catholic ritual. And one of the mysteries is uh, Christ's bearing of his cross. And someone helps him. And this isn't the really, I'm not, I'm not speaking about this religiously. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking about it practically and psychologically. There's a, it's a remarkable story because it implies that human existence, like our subjugation to vulnerability, which is exemplified in that story to be rejected by the crowd, to be betrayed, to be killed. That subjugation is so difficult that even God himself needed help. Mm -hmm. And so the question is that, and like I said, I'm not speaking religiously. I, I'm, I'm looking at the story in some sense as a psychologist. It's like, well, what does that imply? Well, it implies you have to call on, on, <laughs> you have to note when you're being called to be more than you are and you have to attend to that very carefully because life is extraordinarily difficult and to manage it in a manner that makes it acceptable or perhaps more than acceptable you have to be everything you could be. So that's not exactly strength, right? It's, it's way more than that. Strength is a, is a way into it. It's a, ver it's a specific virtue. It's a way into this, into the discussion of what constitutes the ideal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, so that's a long answer to your question. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying to unpack it in my head. Well, that'll take you about a year yeah. or two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could, I could see, see. one of the things I've been wrestling with, see, see, because I've talked to uh, and, and thought very deeply about materialist atheism and, and reductive materialism. And I believe there are genuine flaws with that perspective, really s significant uh, and in some sense irreparable flaws. So, for example, the reductive materialist atheist types, people like Richard Dawkins, who I have great respect for, by the way, they they're there are they don't they're wrestling with a reduced version of the devil they're attempting to conquer. They treat religious propositions as if, first of all, as if the domain of, of the religious is nothing but a set of propositions about the structure of reality in the same way that a scientific mm -hmm. theory is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then having made that initial move, which is often no not noticed by the people who are being engaged within the argument, once that move is accepted, it's, it's easy to push all that aside as superstitious nonsense because as a set of scientific propositions, it's lacking. But that isn't what it is at all. It's not that at all. Or if it is that, it's that only peripherally. And so then we can go deeper and we can think, well, where do we see these calls to, to an expanded ethic? Where do we experience that? Not, not where do we think about it? Where do we experience it? Well, you experience it when you listen to great music. Mm -hmm. You know, music, music speaks of the harm of the 
of the hierarchy of patterns in some sense that characterize the world. And, you know, move, move, music tends to make you move and sometimes in unison with other people as well. And people love that. They love music. It's not rational. It's underneath rationality. And deep immersement in music borders on the religious, psychologically speaking. I'm trying to explain these sorts of things to people. And, and archi beautiful architecture. I mean, you think about all the people who go visit Europe mm -hmm. and what they go to see. They go to see beauty. They're called to make a pilgrimage to architectural beauty. They don't know why. Well, part of it is, well, look what we're capable of. Experience what we're capable of. Well, then you see that and you think, well, why did that all come about, that beauty? What, what is it aiming at? What is it pointing at? Well, these are serious questions. They're not, you can't just brush them away with, with a, an argument that makes the entire domain of religious experience a form of primitive, explicit propositions about the structure of reality. That isn't what it is. Mm -hmm. It's hardly that at all. Dance is the same thing in some ways. You know, you, you move to the music and, and the music is ripped is reflecting the patterns of reality. And to move to the music is to act out the proposition that you should be harmoniously related in your movement and your utterances when you sing to the pattern structures of existence. It's like, well, who can deny that? And then look what happens if you do deny that. Well, then you stop listening to music and you stop dancing. Mm. Well, really? You want to, really? Mm -hmm. You want to stop doing that? No, you want to do that all the time. You want to spend every second doing that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to understand all that and to try to communicate it to people. It's crucially important. Okay, so you're explaining that if you look at religion through the lens of this is a method for understanding the objective reality, that is the wrong way to look at it. But by investigating things like religion, you can start to kind of understand our values or or how our His values well so here's the problem so here's the problem and, and this is what should how sh how should you see the world what lens should you look at the world through and how should you act okay you have to answer those questions those are questions of value now you could conjecture that science can provide answers to those questions but that is by no means obvious. So serious philosophers of science have disputes about that very topic. I mean, someone like Sam Harris has proposed that we can derive a set of universal values objectively. But, but many serious thinkers don't presume that. Stephen Jay Gould, who was a Marxist evolutionary biologist, a very famous one, he I believe it was Gould who formulated the two magisterium theory. There's a domain of objective inquiry and there's a domain of values and they're actually separate. Hmm. And science, you think science strives to be value free. Now it can't entirely do that because scientists have to choose what they're going to investigate and they do that from within the frame of a value structure. But hypothetically in its ideal, science is value free and that means it doesn't rank order its objects in any way that would guide you when you were act interacting with them. If you decide how to do something, then maybe you could use the scientific method to figure out how to do it more efficiently. But there's still that, that first decision. And then if you look to science to provide your values, and, and science can't do that, then what happens is that science gets hijacked, say by ideology or by politics or even by religion for that matter, and invisibly or visibly or explicitly. And, and that's not a good thing, not if they're actually separate. Well, and then if they are separate, then we have a question, don't we? From where do we derive our values validly? Mm -hmm. And if you say there are no valid values, well, then that's nihilistic. It's confusing because what do you do then? <laughs> Nothing's more important than everything is equally unimportant. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's indis if you really believe that and you act it out, that's virtually indistinguishable from being clinically depressed and, and paralyzed, let's say, by anxiety. Mm. Well, 
that doesn't seem, I mean, you could say, well, the universe is so brutal in its fundamental reality that if you saw it in its unvarnished, if you saw it unvarnished, you would become depressed and terrified. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you could make that claim and that that's actually an accurate way of viewing the world. Mm -hmm. But that's pretty, that's a pretty hopeless idea. It isn't helpful to people and you shouldn't jump to the conclusion that it's true. Mm -hmm. So we have to have a serious conversation about this. Where do we derive, from where do we validly derive our values? And so I've spent my whole life trying to understand that. And partly because I, I was terrified into pursuing that question because part of the way people de derive their values sometimes is by falling prey to totalitarian ideologies. And then what happens? Well, millions of people die. Mm -hmm. or, we, or we start a war and maybe a thermonuclear war. So this isn't an optional, this exercise isn't optional. That that reminds me of one of the one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is what do you mean by a map of meaning and why did you decide to Ooh. title your 1999 book that? So, well, you need that. I believe, and I believe this as a scientist, and is that you perceive the world through a structure of value that is essentially a map of the territory. So when you look out at the world, you think, well, there's the world, that's the objective world. But obviously, you don't just see the objective world, because we wouldn't have to have, we wouldn't have had to develop science to give us a picture of the objective world, if you just saw the objective world. Mm -hmm. It's actually pretty damn difficult to formalize an objective picture of the world. So if you don't see the objective world, well, what is it that you see? Well, a lot of what you see, a tremendous amount of what you see is memory. Like you don't know that, but your brain uses memory to represent things whenever it can, because look, seeing the world is unbelievably challenging neurologically. I mean, the center part of your vision, the fovea, which is what you use to look right in someone else's eyes, what you use to focus on when you need high resolution image. So the high resolution part of your eye is a very small part of the fovea. And the reason for that is that every cell in the fovea is connected to 10,000 neurons in the primary visual cortex, and then they're connected to a very large number of additional neurons. Each neuron has maybe something like 10,000 connections. So if your whole fovea, if your whole retina was fovea, your head would have to be this big just to hold the visual cortex. Mm -hmm. And so we, we exercise the use of our central vision very selectively. We only look at what's important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, what's important is what's valuable. Well, you don't know that you're making an unbelievably complex value laden decision whenever you look at something. It's happened, like it's actually the frame through which you see the world. And it's a map. And the reason for that is, well, you have to do things. You have to get from point A to point B. You, you're a mobile creature. And so, you have to see the world as a place to traverse. And this isn't, this, although I rely on religious metaphor and narrative, the reason for that, at least in part, is because it appears to me that the evidence that we see the world through a narrative structure is overwhelming. And I think that if you don't know that as a psychologist, what that means is you actually don't know the literature. Now, I derived part of this theory in Maps of Meaning from a book called The Neuropsychology of Anxiety by Jeffrey Gray. And mm. Jeffrey Gray was a student of Hans Isaacs, who was the most published psychologist who ever lived, if I remember correctly. And Gray was unbelievably smart. That book took me about six months to read and understand. It was an entire education in and of itself. It's unbelievably dense. Uh, the neuropsychology of anxiety. I think he, in the bibliography, there's something like 1,700 research papers. Wow. And Jeffrey Gray was one of those scientists who actually read all those papers and understood them mm. and integrated them. And so there's 1,700 research papers worth of information packed into the neuropsychology of anxiety. 
And he was influenced by Norbert Weiner's thinking, or Weiner, I don't know how to pronounce it, but he was the father of cybernetics and one of the fathers of, of the entire computer revolution. And so all that's packed in there too. And so Gray developed a theory of emotion that's predicated on the idea that, essentially on the idea that most of your emotions are experienced in relationship to a goal. Okay. And so you establish a goal, then movement towards that goal or evidence that you could move towards that goal mm -hmm. makes you happy, mm -hmm. produces positive emotion, whereas evidence that the goal is invalid or that you're blocked in some way produces negative emotion. Mm -hmm. So you lay this map on the world. It, has a dest it always has a destination point in mind. It, 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 there's always a destination point implicit in it or explicit in it. So it's, and it works as subtly as this, for example. So if you walk into your room and you're, and you're, uh, you want to walk towards something to pick it up and your room is cluttered because you've been careless, all that clutter manifests itself as an obstacle to your goal and produces a negative emotion. And, and do you experience that instantaneously, essentially and automatically? And so part of the reason you know, that I encourage people to clean up their rooms, mm -hmm, let's say, mm -hmm. is, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a microcosm of all this. Y your room is part of the part of your experience that you have control over. And it's easy to underestimate its significance, but you have, that's a place you can alter. You can set it up for whatever it is that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Well, what are you doing? Well, that's the first question you have to ask yourself if you're going to set up your room. It's not trivial. It's hard and it's worthwhile and it's a good starting place. This is reminding so, me of how I was reading one of your, your papers. Uh, let me see. It was Psychological Entropy, a Framework for Understanding Uncertainty-Related oh, yes. Anxiety. I actually made a, yes, a video yes. focusing on this and... Uh, Oh, Tr trying to trying to explain a lot of the the concepts in it, and it was. I mean, there was just something about that because I feel like I've struggled with, uh, not really anxiety to where I wouldn't say to someone I have anxiety, but just kind of these this low level something that's been nagging me, and I would call it anxiety mm -hmm. and then when i was reading your paper i was like actually mm -hmm. it's more like yeah it's uncertainty i'm constantly mm -hmm. uncertain and and not very confident that the action no, here's here's mm -hmm. okay here's an here's an example we're trying to tie anxiety down to an even more basic concept like entropy mm -hmm. and and entropy is a well in, in some sense the study of entropy is part of the domain of physics so we're trying to push the the issue of anxiety all the way down to the level of physics in that paper. Mm -hmm. That's the background mm -hmm. intellectual exercise. So imagine this. So picture this. So you're, you're, you're driving somewhere in your car. Maybe you want to go visit your girlfriend. Okay. So you want to see her. So now you're in this frame, right? And the goal is the destination point and what's waiting there. And the map obviously includes your car. So you see your car, you're inside, you see your car, you think you see your car, but you don't. And you don't even want to. Part of what car designers do is make it unnecessary for you to see the car. See, they cover the whole car with a homogenous shell mm -hmm. that's like a one pixel image. And that's so that you don't get discomforted by the complexity of the car. Mm -hmm. And the car can the one pixel representation of the car, which is this sh shiny outer shell, is perfectly appropriate as long as the car works. Because you can reduce it to nothing. You can reduce it to an assumption. Okay, so now you're driving to see your girlfriend and a warning light goes on in the dash. Well, what's happening is the implicit complexity of the automobile has just revealed itself to you. And it's threatening the integrity of your map. And that's destabilizing your emotions. And the reason they destabilize is because you've entered a high entropy state. You were in a low entropy state where everything was certain. Mm. You could get from point A to B and mm -hmm. you knew exactly how to do that. You knew exactly how much energy it was going to take. And you, you knew how long, how much time it was going to take. And all of a sudden, 
something has emerged from the chaos that underlies everything, the complex chaos that underlies everything, and it's signaling to you. And what does it signal? Well, part of what it signals is your unbelievable stupidity in relationship to your car. Mm -hmm. Because it's, I mean, when I was your age, I could sort of understand a car. And if something went wrong with it, I could sort of maybe fix it and probably not. But at least I could understand it. But now it's like, forget it. All that electronics, mm. you can't even get at it. And so the light goes on and, and see what happens now is the map has now become of indeterminate length. How many steps is it going to take you to get to where you were going? Well, it depends on how serious the issue is with your car. Well, that's where your mind starts to go. It's like, well, how serious is this? Should I buy a new car? Was I an idiot when I bought this car to begin with? Am I going to be able to afford this? <laughs> Am I going to get um, taken for a ride by a malevolent mechanic because I'm ignorant? And so there's an eth a whole problem of ethics immediately emerges as well. Mm -hmm. you know, because now the car doesn't work, but that means you might have to have an encounter with untrustworthy uh, po pseudo helpers. And that, that's another, also another revelation of your own insufficiency and ignorance, because maybe you're so naive that you're easily fleeced and you're just a walking target for that sort of thing. And all of that pops up. It's the Hydra, it's the Medusa, it's, it's the snakes that are everywhere. They pops up and freezes you. Mm -hmm. That happens all the time in life. And that's part of what I was writing about in Maps of Meaning. And so then the question is, how do you deal with all those snakes? That's the permanent question. Mm. You're permanently susceptible to the radical disruption of your low entropy maps. Mm -hmm. Permanently susceptible to that. Well, you can't build a map that isn't susceptible to that. So what do you do? You build yourself into someone who can deal with the anomalous. And that's the hero who faces the dragon. So what's a dragon? A dragon is a monstrous assemblage of unpredictable predators. Tree, cat, snake, bird. That's a dragon. There's no such thing as dragons. Yes, there is. It's a sophisticated, abstract conceptualization of the possibility of predation and disruption itself. It took the human imagination untold centuries to formulate that representation. It's danger as such. Okay, now we have a representation of danger as such. What is the human being who can deal with that as such? Well, that's a religious ideal. One of the things that uh, your lectures did for me that was really significant is it kind of showed to me the utility of religious texts. Well, the Bible, because I've considered myself an atheist for a very long time. So when I think of the Bible, it's just kind of like, oh, okay, that's eliminated from my value structure. So I don't have to worry about that. But then, yes, as you're, as I was listening to you, I, I, um, let me see. I mean, there's, there's a lot of reasons why my, uh, perception of it changed, but one of the things that, uh, that I liked was how you were explaining that we need to consider the Bible from its symbolic it, it, not in terms of is it uh, objectively true, but what is the utility of the symbology within it? Essentially, um, as people interacted with the world and had their direct experiences with the world, they wanted to express the the utility they derived from the world or or what functional knowledge they gained from the world. And so this was expressed in stories. And so what mm -hmm. they couldn't say explicitly, they said in the form of a narrative, in the form of a story. And mm -hmm. before that, they acted it out before they even told stories. They acted it out. That was the first thing. Sure, that, that's, you got that exactly right. And, and so once you, once you understand, perhaps, start to accept the proposition, or at least investigate the proposition, that we actually view the world through a story, well, then, it, it, first of all, you think, well, is that a valid proposition? So, well, why are you so interested in stories if that isn't the case? Why are children so fascinated by them? Why do, if you want to teach a child something, you hook them with a story? Why is the human mind wired up to, to find stories so compelling that you will pay people to tell them to you? What's going on? Well, it's not nothing. 
okay, so what's the, and then we seem all to have the intuition that stories differ in their depth. Oh, that's shallow. That was a shallow movie. That was a deep movie. We experience that in terms of, and, and we have a metaphor for shallow versus deep. Deep is like water. Mm -hmm. What's deep down there in the depths? Well, that's the question that manifests to itself to us when we listen to a deep story. Well, that catches us outside our rationality. Well, what's it pointing to? Well, that's the question. And, and, it, and see, this isn't a rational question. You have to observe your own experience. Are you gripped by stories? Yes. Do you believe they vary in depth? Yes. Do you know what that means? Well, not explicitly, but you experience it. Okay, let's take that experience apart. Well, a deep story signifies many things. Whereas a shallow story signifies only one or two. If it's a deep story, it might fundamentally change the way you view everything. That's what the deepest stories do. Well, so then we, we tell stories over centuries, over millennia. And some of them we remember. Well, why? Well, because they fit the shape of our mind. Well, why? Well, for evolutionary reasons, if you want to get scientific about it. It's like, well, we have to fight off predators. Well, what exactly is a predator? And then, because a predator, see, just that word, is, is an abstraction from a set of differentiated phenomena. A wolf isn't the same as a shark, but they're both predators. So there's already an abstraction there. You abstract up the idea of predator, and they say, how do you defend yourself against a predator? Well, then you might say, what's the best defense against the worst predator? Then you might say, what's the worst predator? So let me give you an example. My wife and I were talking about this image of Mary. She's praying the rosary. So she's communing with the image of the divine feminine. That's psychological interpretation. So you might say, well, is that real? Well, let's take it apart a bit. Mary has, in this image, Mary has her head in the stars, 12 stars. Her head is in the stars, and she's standing on a serpent. Well, what does it mean to have your head in the stars? Well, it means you're something of cosmic significance, that's the first thing, but it also is related to this issue that we talked about at the beginning of this talk. It's like, well, where is your head when you're looking at the stars? Well, it's trying to establish a relationship between you and the infinite. So Mary is the element of the feminine that's attempting to establish a relationship with the infinite. So her head is in the ultimate ideal, wherever that is. And you think, well, is there a difference between a good mother and a bad mother? Well, you can certainly identify a bad mother. So you can, you can hypothesize about the opposite of that. And then you could think of, well, what would the best mother possible? What mm -hmm. would that look like? Well, so, so that's Mary and, and her head would be in the stars because it's, it, she's oriented towards the ultimate ideal. Mm -hmm. And I was just speaking of the meaning of the image. Okay, now her foot is on a serpent. Well, what's the serpent? Well, that's the snake that's come in for a hundred million years to take your, your infant in the night. It's definitely that. But then what's the worst of all predators? Well, then, well, then that starts to take on something that's more like more human in some sense, more malevolent. Is there a worse predator than Hitler? Is there a worse predator than Stalin or Mao? Well, I would say so. The spirit that animated all of them. That's the worst possible predator. And you orient yourself to the highest good. To protect yourself and everything you love against that. And if you don't do that, well, then you're not doing that. Well, what else should you be doing if you're not doing that? What could you possibly be doing that would supersede that? If you understand it. Well, that's the sort of thing that I'm trying to understand and to tell people about. You've talked about this instinct to orient ourselves to the ideal, right? Yes. Do you ever find that that can be maybe too much for people or they, they patho Often. pathologize it somehow? Like, oh God, it's, 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 
Yeah, you, Carl Jung wrote a great essay about that called Relations Between the Ego and the Unconscious. And, and that, that bloody essay saved my life, I would say. I mean, dealing with these sorts of issues for, like when I, I wrote Maps of Meaning, it took me 15 years. I worked on it about three hours a day. And like I worked on it all the time, every day. Sick or not, holidays or not, all the time. Thinking about it all the time. And it's overwhelming. It's absolutely overwhelming to grapple with such things. It's very dangerous psychologically in some sense too. It's so serious. You know, it's down there at the bottom and it's very, very serious. And it, it's overwhelming. You know, and I think some of that might have been what, what I've had some bad health. And I think some of, some of it is for this reason. I've seen a lot. I've seen deep into the misery of very many people, mm -hmm. thousands of people. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, I had someone phone me last night. And he, uh, well, he just sobbed uncontrollably for, you know, for five minutes or so. I didn't know who he was. And, you know, his grandmother had died of cancer and his mother had died and his fiance had left him and he had been suicidal and that wasn't all that had happened to him. And, you know, he thanked me for the videos and I've seen a lot of that serious business, this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you approach it at your peril and with all defenses intact and carefully, but that, uh, well, it doesn't matter. That's life's a serious business and you're an important, you have a, you have a deep intrinsic value. And if you don't bring it to the surface, the world is much lessened as a consequence of your failure. And it might be crucial, crucial what you have in you. Do you did you find that any of your ideas changed when you started to see how big of an impact they were having on people? Did that, getting that feedback, did that kind of change your perception on on uh, any of the ideas that you've talked about? Or maybe... I wouldn't... I, 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 guess, I guess it changed them in some sense. It's, I hadn't... I didn't really understand until I went on tour, I would say. I didn't understand how much people are starving for a word of encouragement. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that, that, that the desperate depth of that starvation and to see why that is is so affecting i guess i saw it most particularly in the case of young men mm -hmm. not limited to young men but that's where i could see it most i don't know grippingly in some sense because well you know masculinity is toxic and Human beings are a cancer on the face of the planet. We're an uncontrolled mm -hmm. virus and everything we do is destructive and we're leading the entire cosmos to perdition. And, you know, it's, those are deep doubts. And fair enough. I do believe in the environmental movement, there's a call, an unrecognized call to individual responsibility, but it shouldn't be purchased at the cost of the denigration of, of the human being. And I don't, uh, that's not helpful. It's, it's, it's a form of resentment and hatred disguised as, as ethical striving and it's deadly. And, and so I'm, tar I'm, I'm doing what I can to encourage, to encourage. Mm. I don't believe that human beings are a cancer on the face of the planet. Mm -hmm. I think that, you eradicate a cancer, and if you have that view, then you might ask yourself just what it is that you're trying to do with your metaphor and why. It seems like young men have been deprived of this encouragement, and does it, is that that they seem to have been kind of not shamed, but discouraged for aiming towards the ideal, or they have some sort of... Well, I had, I had a friend who committed suicide, and, you know, he, he was a smart person and deeply troubled by 
questions of meaning. God only knows the full totality of the reasons. He didn't have a good relationship with his father. He had contempt for his father, who I knew and who I thought didn't deserve the depth of contempt that my friend had for him. But mm -hmm. in any case, he didn't have a good relationship with his father. And so that's a problem if you're a, a man, because you turn into your father, you know, so, mm -hmm. so that's a problem. But, you know, he came to believe that human activity as such was destructive. And so any ambition that he had was a malevolent in its essence. Mm -hmm. And so he tried to live a kind of nihilistic Buddhism, a self-negating Buddhism. He viewed himself as a, an agent of oppression. He wrote a short story once about living in Northern Alberta. And he went, his, he moved around a lot when he was a kid and he, he went to a small town, High Prairie, I think it was, uh, had a large indigenous population. So there were a lot of we, Indian kids. That's, that's the vernacular of the story. And he got beat up one day by a group of Indian kids and he wouldn't defend himself. I mean, he was 10 in the story, you know, he wouldn't defend himself because he was a colonial oppressor. Uh, you know, so you think a 10 year old can't think like that. It's like, yeah, yeah, they're smarter than you think. And so he didn't think he had any moral right to defend himself. And so that's just, and he was a sensitive person. And so, you know, and it's, it's a thorny ethical issue, isn't it? It's, it's not that he was thrown sideways by something trivial, but he, he killed himself. Well, I guess he isn't causing the world any trouble now, except the trouble caused by his absence. What, what do you think about his environment would have kind of, uh, so how long ago was this when he had written the short story? Well, he, he probably died 20 years ago and he would have written the short story about that 20, 22, 23 years ago. He had them published in a small collection. He sent me the book and told me about it the day before he killed himself. Wow. So, and I saw him, you know, I, I saw this unfold over with him over a very long period of time. I wrote a little bit about it in 12 Rules and a bit in Maps of Meaning because mm -hmm. I knew him very well. And, you know, it, that we don't want to allow the examination of our faults to turn into the denigration of our essence. Mm -hmm. That's not good. That's not and so what is our essence? That's the, you know, that's mm -hmm. the, also the question that arises out of this to some degree. Well, as far as I'm concerned, that's logos. And Christianity is an examination of logos among many other things. And I'm not trying to limit the understanding of what's meant by logos to Christianity, but, mm -hmm. but, but I am a Westerner. And so, you know, that's my, that's me in some sense that, that milieu. Yeah. And the log logos is a very complicated idea. It's partly the root word for logic, right? Uh -huh. Which is very interesting. It's also the word that created everything out of chaos at the beginning of time. It's also the enemy of Satan. It's also the, the it's, it's what's made flesh in Christianity. Well, those are very strange ideas. Mm -hmm. They're not, you don't just say, well, those are propositions about the structure of objective reality that we've superseded because they're superstitious. It's like, you don't, you're like someone pointing out flaws in the screen when you're watching a movie. You, 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 you don't get the picture. Yeah, it's like, it's like saying, oh, Pinocchio was so terrible because it doesn't make any sense for a puppet to come alive. Yes, it's exactly like what kind of, what kind of, that's exactly it. What kind of uh, materialist, what kind of objective representation is in Pinocchio? There's no fire breathing whales <laughs> at the bottom of oceans and there's no cats uh -huh. that tempt you on the way to becoming an actor and exactly that. Uh -huh. and, and so we, it's strange to associate something like Pinocchio with something like the biblical stories, let's say, mm -hmm. but it's not so strange. I mean, S Pinocchio is saturated, absolutely saturated, beyond belief with Christian imagery. Mm -hmm. The entire scene inside the whale is a imagistic examination of the symbolism of the fish. Mm -hmm. It's stunning. It's stunning to see. 
And it's not like the animators knew that that's what they were doing. See, they're genius level animators. They're collaborating. It feels right, right? Their instinct guided them to that representation. And so our, and why would our instincts do that? Well, they're, orient us, they're orienting us towards imitation. And well, what should you imitate? Well, you, you do imitate. You're driven to imitate by those you admire and respect. In fact, admiration and respect are the emotions that manifest themselves as part of the instinct to imitate. Well, what should you imitate? Well, you should imitate. If you're going to imitate anything, well, why not imitate the best? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the best? Well, the best is everything that calls out you to calls you out to imitate it. <laughs> That's what the best is. You see it, and you see it, and you're gripped by it because you admire someone. Yeah, it's like why do you admire them? Where does that come from exactly? Mm -hmm. Going back to the the imagery and the the symbolism in Disney films, was there a particular Disney film that you particularly disliked? For, oh, yeah, for, there was for, a bunch for of For any them. reason. Uh, for, but I can't, I don't really remember. Uh, I've been so ill that my memory is somewhat faulty. Um, so they're frozen, if I remember correctly. A lot of later Disney films, like in the last five years, ten years, the animators, the animators have been, they've been possessed by ideology. Mm -hmm. they're, they're trying to craft a message. Pocahontas was like that. Mm -hmm. Like there's an explicitly anti-colonial message in Pocahontas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's not, that's not helpful because the art form isn't explicit. Mm -hmm. It's the wrong level of analysis. Kind of. it's the, so they're hijacking the, the medium to do something that isn't what it does. Whereas in Pinocchio, there's some moralizing, there's some explicit moralizing in Pinocchio. It degenerates from time to time into explicit moralizing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the, it's a flaw in the film. It, it doesn't help the film at all. It, the film is brilliant when it doesn't do that. It does, when what it does instead is an, an exploration of compelling imagery. Mm -hmm. And so and that, when that's shared with the viewing audience, then that's, that grips people. Deep, deeply, deeply, deeply. Yeah. Lion King too. I, I like the Lion King, but but it's more explicit than it should be. Oh, really? And it it has well because by the time the Lion King was made, there was more understanding about the structure of the hero myth. Uh, and, I see. And you see that in, in because of Joseph Campbell in large part, uh -huh. and, and and who was mostly influenced by Carl Jung. So there's a bit of explicit patterning after the hero narrative. And that kind of makes it, mm -hmm. what would you say? It's manipulative in some sense. It's not guided entirely by poetic intuition, let's say. I see. So, but, but look, I mean, I've used the, I used the Lion King to great effect. Well, on my YouTube videos, they be videos of my university lectures, extremely helpful. Some of it's absolutely brilliant. And Beauty and the Beast, I think is, the best Disney film, all things considered. Oh. It's 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 very witty. It's the, yeah. I like the music. It's it doesn't moralize. Mm -hmm. It's got a great female hero. It's it is an investigation into ideal femininity mm -hmm. and and the redemptive power of femininity. And one of the things that's so subtle about Beauty and the Beast is that you have Gaston, mm -hmm. and Gaston isn't a monster, mm -hmm. but he is, which is why Beauty doesn't like him. He's got everything. He's tall. And he sings that. I've got everything. Look <laughs> at me. I'm tall. I'm handsome. I'm strong. I'm, I'm brave. He's all persona. Uh -huh. Like he's all surface. And he isn't the monster because the, the beast is the monster. Mm -hmm. But the beast is real. Mm -hmm. And beauty can see that. And she turns away from the narcissistic persona and pursues the redeemable beast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you don't understand, if you don't see that that's how human beings l interact with each other, you're not looking. Mm -hmm. And women are that. And the woman wants the redeemable beast because the redeemable beast has the virtues of the beast. And if you want someone to protect you and your infants from beasts, you need someone with the virtue of the beast. And so, but, but he has to be redeemed because as a beast, he's a beast. That's no, you want a beast in your house? It's like, no, it's not, that's not good. He has to be, 
He has to be civilized beast. That's what I'm encouraging young men to be. Civilized beasts. <laughs> that that reminds me of how you've uh, you talked about the Jungian concept of the shadow and how we need to integrate it. And that helps us become a more uh, a person that we're more satisfied with. What are some, let's say, practical steps to doing that? And if you don't mind me asking, do you remember your process of integrating your shadow? Oh, definitely. I definitely remember that. Um, oh, I think the best practice is to is to try to not lie, try to stop lying. Mm. Listen to your words. Listen, feel them, feel them. Mm -hmm. Are they the right words? Do you believe this? Do you believe what you're saying? Is it is it true as far as you're concerned? And then then you might find that you have something true to say, but you're afraid to. Mm -hmm. Okay, then there there's a place for integration of the shadow because hopefully you can be monstrous enough to say what you believe to be true. And so that means there's a combativeness in some sense in that. Mm -hmm. And so if you can't do that, so maybe you don't say what's true because you want to look, you want to be a persona, you want to uh, you want to be nice, you want to appeal to people, you want to be popular, whatever, whatever it is yeah. you're pursuing. Yeah. You're going to do it in a manipulative way and and you subjugate your truth to that. That's not helpful. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, well, you're pursuing the road of Gaston in some sense. I mean, he's popular in the village and, you know, he's got a mob behind mm. him and what's not to like. And that's what he says. Yeah. But beauty is, she's wiser than that. She wants something. What do you think of, real? of the, the constant softening of language in North America? George Carlin has talked about that this, this kind of language to soften the reality of things, for example, um, big boned or plus size instead of fat or uh, economically disadvantaged instead of just saying broke. Um, George Carlin did a, a piece explaining how shell shock, which two syllables turn into post-traumatic stress disorder, which I suppose is more accurate. But, but Carlin's point was that shell shock is a lot more visceral and, and to the point. People who object to the word fat, let's say, and to body shaming. Mm. On the upside, you might say that there's a kernel of genuine compassion there. Like maybe it's more appropriate to view obesity as, a, as a, an illness, a metabolic illness. And there's, there's a case to be made for that. Like what's happened to us societally is that we're now a buffet of impossible foods has been permanently prepared for us. High sugar, high carbohydrate. Those were rare treasures, historically speaking. And so that's now that plenitude is now built into our environment. And, and, and obesity is a, is a disease that's a consequence of that. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's, you, you can see that, assessment at that level of analysis takes away the moral element and it, and and also the moral stigma that's associated with being obese and there's utility in that but by the same token well in principle it is something that behavioral change can rectify at least to some degree so the fact that we have those arguments about language is a reflection of that underlying tension between the almost the plague of obesity, let's say, which should be viewed sociologically and economically and medically, mm -hmm. and the s simultaneous call for personal action in the face of such things. So now that that's that's to give the devil his due. Well, then there's also, well, I can if I object to your language, well, that's really easy for me to do, and I can be sanctimonious and like exercise my moral superiority without any effort whatsoever on my part. And, and that's the crooked downside of it. And so then I can use my moral objections to your language as a signal of my ethical superiority to you and mm -hmm. your type. And, and that's the, the terrible attraction of that sort of maneuvering. Mm -hmm. So, 
So you're, I'm skeptical of it when, when that language emerges. It's like, yeah, really? That's really what you're motivated by? Your motivations are so pure? Are they? Really? It, it also seems like many new words are generated. And then on the one hand, the idea of the new word is to, um, again, kind of be less harsh to, or be, the intention is to mm -hmm. be more compassionate to uh, certain people. But then hypothetically uh, hypothetically mm -hmm. but then the effect mm -hmm. is that the previous usage of the previous word which people uh, had been used to using uh, now makes that person immoral or reprehensible mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so you have this constant kind of moving of the of the goalposts. yes um, yes i don't know if you want instead of to yes mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you want to get into this but um so as i spoke in the introduction i thought that essentially your your goal or it seems that the the um the the goal of your ideas like i said is to basically help people uh find meaning and make their lives better so you know if f from my perspective it i kind of don't totally understand why um certain critics of yours have such an intense reaction where, where do you think that comes from i mean I assume it's some sort of well part mm -hmm. of it part of it i would say is luck of the draw hmm. you know um i my i i went from let's say relative obscurity to whatever degree of notoriety i have now fairly suddenly and it was because i got embroiled in a what purported to be what was purported to be a political scandal, right? So, and it was a discussion about language and about who controls language. And I believe that my government had overreached its, its purview in its, in the legislation that it described as motivated by compassion. And so I said that, it's like, you can't tell me what I have to say. Because, well, I have my reasons. I told you what they were. It's like I believe that to the degree that we are who we should be, we're incarnations of Logos. I actually believe that. And so when someone says, you have to say what I want you to say, it's like, no, I don't <laughs> have to. And not only that, I'm not going to. I don't care what your reasons are. Mm -hmm. And so, and then of course, because it was that particular issue, mm -hmm. which happened to be central to the intense partisan fragmentation of the West, it was central at that point in time. I got tangled up in some sense in, in, into, the, into the political discourse. And so... And because I objected to this particular piece of legislation, then it was easy for people who might have been motivated to, to want to do so to say, well, how do I know that you're not, you know, the latest avatar of the far right, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, can, I have some sympathy for that move. It's like, well, why should anyone listen to me? Well, there's 7 billion, 8 billion people. Well, you can't listen to all of them, so mostly what you do is not listen to them. <laughs> so you're always looking for reasons not to listen to mm. someone. And so, so that was part of it. That isn't all of it. Yeah. I mean, that's part of it. That's, that's by no means all of it. There's much more to the story than that. Mm. So Th that's also a good example of the utility of integrating your shadow. I mean, as you were saying, you, you had come to a point where you wanted to speak exactly what was on your mind or you were able to speak exactly what was on your mind. No, I was and then practicing. <laughs> I'd be practicing doing that for a very, very long time. And it, that's part of what accounted for whatever success I had as a lecturer. You know, it, I'd started, I started paying attention to how my words made me feel mm. psychologically when I was about 23. Mm -hmm. I really started to pay attention. And I learned, I learned that that was worth paying attention to. And I swore that I would strive to say, to not lie, 
to not lie, to say what I believe to be the case. And so that was part of the reason why my lectures were popular, say at Harvard and then at the University of Toronto. And before this explosion of notoriety, there was some movement in that direction. I had posted my Maps of Meaning lectures online. That TV station in Toronto had done a 13-part series on the Maps of Meaning course because, really because of the somewhat remarkable student response to the course, you know, because mm -hmm. the typical response to, when in the student evaluations, the typical comment was, this course changed the way I look at everything. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and and people meant that and they'd yeah. say well now that i've taken this course i can't talk to people anymore because <laughs> <laughs> i'm looking at things so differently that 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 it's made conversations much more complicated and so that that had elicited some interest by a by a particular producer wodek shember mm -hmm. who was the person who produced that series and so that was starting but what but then i got tangled up in this political political battleground mm. and and you know then the other part of it too is that it's not just that I got tangled up it's also that I don't believe that the good is served by discourse that presumes that immutable group identity is the appropriate level of profound analysis. I really don't agree with that. I think it's very dangerous. I think that the right level of analysis is the individual. And so I am a, I really am an enemy of the group centered ideologues, the identity politics types They're They don't like me and they're right not to mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I don't agree with what they're doing, like way down at the bottom of things. And that's mm -hmm. also part of what accounts for the vitriol, vitriolic nature and continual nature of the attacks. You know, that all culminated in I this see. Captain Marvel episode, right? Which is so surreal that it just defies Captain America. It just defies, it defies comprehension. The, the Captain, uh, are you talking about the Red Skull? Red Skull. Oh, okay, yeah. I, I did see that. Uh, I, I didn't, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> Going back to your your Maps of Meaning course, um, when I was reading your Maps of Meaning book, it, 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 it was quite clear that you're very influenced by Carl Jung. And one thing that I'm still trying to wrap my head around is Jung's uh, interest in dreams and how and how we can learn about our subconscious and, and become a more integrated person by analyzing our dreams is there any kind of practical methods you would recommend for people to use to analyze their own dreams or, or take something useful out of their dreams so you know we 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 view the world through a map and that map has categories and sometimes and so the categories are the assumptions of our perceptions that's a good way of thinking about it mm -hmm. they're the pre the prerequisites for our perceptions but sometimes they're wrong, which means we perceive wrong. Not that we think wrong, we perceive wrong. Well, there has to be a mechanism to update and correct our perceptual presuppositions. Mm -hmm. That's what dreams do. Hmm. Dreams play with the structure of categories. And they do that while we're asleep so that we don't die while we act out the experimentation. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And so the, the utility and so you might say, well, why is the dream mysterious? Why doesn't it doesn't just reveal itself? And Freud would say, well, it's hiding mm -hmm. something. That was the Freudian idea. And sometimes I think that's true. We don't want to become aware of it. And so maybe we have conscious resistance to the transformation of our perceptions. And the dream might insist. So you'd have a repetitive dream then. But mostly, I think Jung was right in that the dream isn't trying to be mysterious. It's just thinking about things that we don't understand. We don't yet understand. So the dream is the birthplace of explicit thought. The dream surrounds our explicit thought. Just like, just like the fantasies that we watch in movie theaters 
encapsulate our culture. Mm. Our culture is nested inside of those stories. It's this, the same way our rational and propositional thought is nested inside the landscape, the landscape of image and dream. And then outside of that is the, is the realm of action. Is it kind of like how, how we were talking about earlier with, um, we were talking about the Bible and how people would have their experiences in the world and then they would glean something useful from that and then they would act it out and then they would tell it in stories. Is that kind of... Yes, it's part of that process. Okay. Yes, it's, the, it's part of the process by which what is, this is another part of it, by what is being acted out is, is becoming represented in image. Mm-hmm. So imagine a society is acting out a pattern. Well, that is the society, the pattern. If it, if it wasn't a pattern, it wouldn't be a society. Mm-hmm. Well, what is that pattern? Well, the answer is you don't know mm-hmm. because it's too complex. And so you watch it and then you try to map it and you fantasize about what the pattern might be. Well, mm-hmm. sometimes that happens while you're awake. You know, what is it that this person is up to? Fantasies. Mm-hmm. Well, the dream is a deeper manifestation of the same thing. Why is interpreting dreams useful? Well, because it can facilitate the movement of the information that's implicit in the dream image into explicit propositional consciousness. So if you and I discuss one of your dreams, the dream is playing with thoughts that you might not be able to be aware of for like 10 years. Mm. But if you and I discuss the dream and we use other fantasy images to in aid in that investigation mm-hmm. conceivably we can speed up that process of realization and adaptation and so i see it's and so for example you go watch pinocchio well while you're watching it you're dreaming you're dreaming the dream the animators dreamt up and produced you're dreaming and you get whatever's useful about that when you go watch the movie, like virtually no one, it's very small percentage of the population will go to a movie and then analyze its meaning. Mm. And an even smaller percentage of the population is good at that. More generally, you go and you have the experience and you don't reflect on it philosophically afterwards. But if you do, if you can and you do, well, then there are all sorts of other benefits that can be derived from the experience Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean the experience that's just the dream isn't worthwhile it is it's still doing something how do you know if you're interpreting it properly for example i guess my thing with interpreting you don't Mm. okay you don't just well like it but it's the same problem you have when you read a book work of fiction read a hemingway book Mm -hmm. well what does it mean well, you can have an intelligent discussion about it. how do you know you're right? <laughs> well, you don't. <laughs> See, that's part of what's true about the postmodernist literary criticism. What's the canonical interpretation of a text? What does the writer mean? Well, we don't know. Well, is there an infinite number of, of possibilities? In some sense, yes. Well, that's all true. So does that mean the text has no no fixed meaning? Mm-hmm. Well, kind of. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't mean that the text has no meaning. Like, you know, the argument can get pushed too far, even though there's really something to the the, the criticism. Mm-hmm. And, and that realization of the fundamental uninterpretability that manifested itself in literary criticism about the same time that the AI types who were working on artificial intelligence ha- came up with exactly the same problem. They found out, oh, the problem is actually in perceiving the world. We thought that was easy. Mm. It's just the world's made out of things. You just build a robot. It can move around these things. It's like, oh, uh, no, the things don't just announce themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's an, we didn't even know that till like 1962. (laughs) It's like, well, there, where are the things? Well, there they are. Can't you see them? It's like, yeah, well, let's hook a camera to a computer. Can't it see them? No. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> why well those things that you see mm-hmm. aren't there like you think they are <laughs> they're there <laughs> the way that they're there is so complex well like half your brain is devoted to visual perception mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's a really hard problem to solve it's really hard mm-hmm. really 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 hard and lots of people 
Rodney Brooks was the first computer engineer, I think, who really realized this, think that you probably can't really build it, an artificial intelligence that sees objects like we do unless it can act. Because the, because the constituent elements of our perceptions are guides to action. That is what they are. So... I see. Okay, there, so, there, you, there has to be a purpose for the seeing, for the seeing to take place, kind of? Yes, okay. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, at, at the very least, the purpose delimits the perception. Uh -huh. Like, how many ways can you look at a room? Well, the, the, it's the same question as how many, how many ways could you cut up a photograph of a room? Mm -hmm. Well, you could just do that for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One photograph a single two-dimensional photograph of one room, you could divide up an infinite number of ways. Mm -hmm. Well, that's nowhere near as complex as the four-dimensional landscape that we see in front of us, three dimensions plus it, the constant transformations. It's like, how many ways are there, are there to see that? Well, an infinite number of ways or close enough for, for all intents and purposes. So which way is right? Mm -hmm. Well, what do you mean by right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. You mean objectively accurate? Well, does that mean complete? Yeah. So you see everything from the quantum level all the way up the hierarchy at once? Well, you don't, obviously. <laughs> I noticed you've talked about psychedelics in, in some podcasts recently. What do you think about the imagery contained within psychedelic visions? Do you think that they could be have a similar function to how dreams, like Jung was saying, that you can look to your it's dreams? certain. It's certain that they do. Hmm. That's definitely part of what they do. They open up that, 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 that part of the world. We don't understand them at all, psychedelics. So I, I kind of want to get your take on uh, a vision that I had. So this was when I was in Costa Rica. Uh, I had ingested a very powerful psychedelic. And so what was it? Uh, ayahuasca. Uh huh. And so when you're, for anybody who's never done any sort of psychedelic, at least with ayahuasca, when you're um, hallucinating on it, you don't lose perception of the room. So you're still within reality and it's just kind of things are happening within the, the actual space. And so what was happening to me was I could feel it, it genuinely felt like there was some sort of presence trying to push, push my head towards the floor. And it was, and I didn't want to look at what it was trying to make me look at. Um, one of the things that I saw when I turned over was this large, dark being. It looked like it had multiple arms and it was just covered in eyes. And when I saw it, it made a very loud crescendoing sound like the like the build up on a, on symbols and then you finally hit the symbols it was uh why do you think you didn't want to look there that's what i've been trying to figure out um guess so i i kind of have an idea afterwards now that i looked into it and i was kind of i was looking at what is the symbology of these eyes and it's scrutiny, right? So like the eyes of Argus to be trailed by the eyes of Argus. It means you are, you feel like you are intense scrutiny and, mm -hmm. and it was dark. Yeah, it was very dark. It was a dark and you didn't want to look at it. So it's, it's dark scrutiny that you don't want to look at. That's what we've established so far. That's an associational method of dream slash image analysis. And that's part of what Jungians do when they analyze dreams. So the idea is that the dream works on associations between often emotional similarity, but all sorts of associations. And your imagination being somewhat dreamlike does the same thing. So what I might ask you, if you have an image like that, I say, well, what comes to mind? That's why I asked you to guess. Mm. Because then you can see what is associated in your imagination and that can flesh out the, it's sort of like that's the surround of the image. Now that's the on the assumption that this is somewhat dreamlike what you experienced on, under ayahuasca. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's part of the dream analysis process. <clears throat> and it's an exploration. You say, well, how do you know it's right? It's like, well, 
you don't, what you're striving for is something like useful. But it's also now and then you stumble across an interpretation that makes you go, you know, it gives you that feeling of insight. It's like, oh, I realized something I didn't know before. I realized something mm. new has come into reality because of it. And so it's like that. It's it's not much different than, you know, how do you know if a thought is true? Well, mm -hmm. you don't. It's It's hard. This is a hard problem. And there's no fundamental guide to the to accuracy in dream analysis it's just as is the case with literary analysis or art criticism or any of that it's hard mm -hmm. that doesn't mean it can't be done and that it's not useful okay so you have this dark being mm -hmm. that's how it manifests but it's all eyes mm -hmm. and you didn't want to look at it well that seems reasonable why would you want to look at that <laughs> yeah and, and when i when i did look at it though i was captivated by it and i didn't immediately turn away i it was just very um awe-inspiring awesome i was just kind of bewildered by it that seems appropriate yeah <laughs> well it was a dark being covered with eyes that something else was forcing you to look yeah. at it's like it's a good time to feel you know a little discomfited and a bit awestruck perhaps yeah exactly so it wasn't until I think maybe it was uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday that I was looking into like, okay, what is, what would tons of eyes represent? And so I was looking at, what was it? I mean, you've got like the eye of Horus, um, mm -hmm. Argus, and then what is it called? The, the Ophanim, the wheels that are kind of rotating around each other and they're covered in eyes. I think that's Christian symbolism. It's, it's some form of From an Ezekiel? angel. Ezekiel? Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you are subject to dark scrutiny by many eyes. You're on YouTube. Ex exactly. So this, um, that's what I interpret it to be. So this was right around when my mm -hmm. channel was getting quite big. And mm -hmm. I, it used to be that when I would first start making videos, I would just kind of, I thought this was really interesting. I would research it to the best of my ability and just say everything that I knew to be true and present it and edit it together mm -hmm. and present the video. Mm -hmm. And it was just kind of fun mm -hmm. and, and I didn't expect it to blow up. But then once it blew up, I it, it felt like now the scrutiny of mm -hmm. all these people watching my channel was now yeah, affecting well, my- Yeah, well, here's, here's a question for you. What is the multi-eyed malevolent beast attending to you? So it's something like, imagine that all the people that are watching you critically, like they're all in some sense animated by the same spirit because they're part of the same society. They can communicate with one another. They understand each other and they're all criticizing you for one, hypothetically, for one reason or another mm -hmm. so that you could abstract out from them the phenomena of attentive criticism itself or maybe the phenomena of attentive malevolent criticism well, what is that spirit? Well, it was this multi-eyed black entity in mm -hmm. your vision. But the question, what is that spirit? Is it's something like the it's something like the critical mob. Mm -hmm. And no bloody wonder you don't want to look at that. And maybe you don't want to have it look at you. And then what do you do if it does look at you? Well, that's the what we're discussing right now. And you said, you know, when you made your videos, you tried to merely explore and state what you learned mm -hmm. well good to the degree that you were able to do that then you're embodying this logos spirit that we discussed and that's a great thing and no wonder you found it captivating and meaningful it's that's where positive meaning is to be found as far as i can tell i, I mean that experientially but imagine that Everyone has within them a part of themselves that has turned away from that contemptuously or resentfully or out of ignorance or distrust or hatred or for all the reasons you might be motivated not just not to do the right thing, but to do the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a spirit considered abstractly and its enemy is the embodiment of the Logos. And so if you manifest that to any great degree, you're going to attract the attention of its enemy. And that's no joke. 
that's for sure. That, back to that image of Mary, her foot is on the serpent. Well, what's the greatest of all serpents? Well, there's this weird Christian idea, it's an unbelievably strange idea, that the snake in the Garden of Eden was Satan. It's like, why is there, where'd that come from? <laughs> it's a snake. Like, it's also the great adversary of the divine that's incarnated in humanity. Well, what's the greatest of all predators? Well, it's not a wolf. It's not a bear. It's not, it's not just something that's an animal that, like a snake even, that wants to devour you. You're just getting started when you see that. There are things that are so much darker than that that they're, well, they're unimaginably bad. Well, that's the thing that Mary has her foot on. That's what she's protecting her child from. And to do that, she has to have her head in the stars. And when my wife is praying the rosary, what she's doing, and I'm speaking psychologically, is that she's attempting to comprehend the spirit of benevolent femininity, to orient herself towards that and to the degree that it's possible to manifest that in her own being. Well, you don't, you can't just say, well, that's all silly superstition. It's like, mm -hmm. oh yeah? Yeah, really? Now, it's ontological significance. That's a different question. You know, if I say, well, my wife is communing, attempting to commune with the spirit of divine femininity, you might say, well, what sort of reality does that spirit have? Is it merely a construct of human imagination? Well, possibly, but it's collective human imagination over a very long period of time. Like what relationship does that have to the structure of reality itself? The answer is, we don't know. I don't know what role consciousness plays in, in being, no, nor does anyone else. It's very difficult to imagine being without consciousness. Mm -hmm. Is it central then? And what does it mean if it's central? And what does that mean ethically? I wanted to ask you a question about Buddhism and, and it's kind of about, about the nature of consciousness. Well, let me just read it out because it took a little while to, to formulate. So uh, you've explained that we need to strive for something that is meaningful enough to make the suffering inherent in life bearable. Similarly, the first noble truth in Buddhism is that suffering is an inescapable part of life and the way to transcend this suffering is by achieving enlightenment, which requires intense investigation into the nature of your consciousness. So throughout this investigation, you're supposed to ponder that all experiences are characterized by three things, which is dissatisfaction, impermanence, and the absence of a self. I, I don't know if you've encountered that concept, this concept of the three characteristics, but what do you think of that? Well, in some sense, suffering is the central question. Because when you suffer, that's the central question. <laughs> what is this? Why is it happening? Why is reality constituted so this is possible? What, if anything, should I do about it? What does this mean about the significance of things in general? So it's a permanent problem. I don't know enough about Buddhism in some sense to answer your question, I would mm -hmm. say. I mean, I know that I know what I know from analyze from my what rather shell familiarity with the central Buddhist story. I mean, Buddha obtains enlightenment, but and he's in Nirvana and hypothetically he can stay there, but he doesn't. He comes back because everyone else isn't there. And so in, in a way, there's a, this element of transcendence that characterizes Buddhist belief. In, in a sense, it's a rising above it all. But then in the foundational story, though there are variants of this story, Buddha re seems to regard the pulling of everyone else into this state of enlightenment as a primary ethical requirement. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be something that contrasts with the idea of transcendent in action. So that's about all I can make of that. And I mean, in Maps of Meaning, I assessed that story in some detail and drew parallels between it and the story of Adam and Eve in the fall. Mm -hmm. Because Buddha, 
I mean, he he basically falls as a consequence of inco- in, encountering. He falls out of paradise because he encounters death, essentially subjugation to death. It's very similar, deep at a deep level to what happens to Adam and Eve. And then, I mean, the entire biblical narrative is a story of the fall and then the manifestation of a mode of being that's a rectification for the fall. And that's mm-hmm. what Christ is, is he's a representation of how to be such that the catastrophic fall into history is rectified. And that's what the Buddha is. And there are major similarities structurally. There are important differences as well. But I'm not versed enough in Eastern thought to be able to comment past that. I don't want to overstate the similarities or overstate the differences, partly because I can't, because I don't know the tradition well enough. And so you have to be, in some sense, steeped in it. It has to be, I think, it has to be part of what you were you grew up in to really understand it. So yeah. lots of people say they're Buddhist from the West, but, well, you know, probably they aren't. <laughs> So one one other thing, um, how are you on time, by the way? Mm, I'm starting to get tired, so we should we should probably move towards closing relatively soon. Okay, um, so I won't say anything worth listening to soon. Then, let me. Okay, I, I was going to ask you about alchemy, and I, but I think that might be a bit oh, too much. Oh, something to, difficult. <laughs> yeah, no, no. We did, I, I wrote about alchemy and maps of meaning, but it pushed me past my cognitive limitations and i could almost never lecture about it it was i couldn't get it in my head it was too complicated Uh so no we should probably should do that (laughs) okay something simpler actually i was planning to ask you this at the very start of the interview but uh i noticed you like the simpsons and i was wondering what your favorite (laughs) episode of the simpsons was oh i think my favorite scene i it's the episode where Homer gets trapped in the garage right at the beginning. He's cleaning up the garage and he throws away one ski and he uh, sprays himself in this face with spider poison. <laughs> and uh, I think it's called, what's the name of that famous spider in that kid's book that, was it Matilda? Oh, uh, I don't re- I'm sorry. I can't, I can't remember. The spider babe? Is- Charlotte. Oh, Charlotte's Web. Okay. It's Charlotte's Web, yeah. I think it was Charlotte Poison or something like that. Charlotte's Web, yes. Anyways, I think the opening of that episode is the funniest five minutes of animation ever produced. <laughs> it it bears like 10 rewatchings. There's so many jokes crammed into it. It's so brilliant. I really like the episode where Bart and Lisa play hockey. It's an earlier mm, one. Mm-hmm. And it, it it sort of shows The Simpsons at its best, where it's it's satirical, and even cynical, but there's this underlying motif of familial love. Mm. And I thought that episode nailed that combination extraordinarily well. And so uh, that's a great episode. When Lisa becomes a vegetarian, that's a great episode. Um, it's very, very funny. And the first 13 seasons were stunningly brilliant. And yeah, uh, and I, I've watched them. I've watched every Simpsons episode at least five times. Yeah, me too. It's It's kind of a... Um, kind of a meme on my channel that people know that I use the Simpsons pretty much as stock footage every now and then because they've they've covered pretty much any situation. So if you need any sort That's of stock funny. footage, this is this is actually true. The only TV show that I allowed my children to watch for years was The Simpsons. Mm. And when they were so <laughs> a terrible experiment to conduct on your children, <laughs> they used to cover their eyes when Itchy and Scratchy came oh. on when they were young. <laughs> I always thought Itchy and Scratchy was, I didn't think it was a high point of mm-hmm. The Simpsons. I thought it was a bit over the top. But yeah. anyways, um, so in our family discussions, we're always peppered with references to The Simpsons because the kids knew all the episodes and that was quite fun oh, and funny. Oh, that's great. That's great. Okay, then I guess uh, the last thing I'd want to ask you, is there anything that that you um, don't often have the opportunity to, but you do want to talk to some topic that you don't, anything that you want to talk about? No, I have so much opportunity to talk that I never never encounter that particular obstacle. So not not really. I, I, we had a pretty good discussion today. And so, yeah, for sure. And, and, so, so that's good. And I, I think it went places that 
that we're good to go. Mm-hmm. And so we should, well, so I thank you for that. And, and uh, yeah, th- appreciate it. Thanks so much. It, it, it really was, um, it was a great, great conversation and I was really glad to have it.